<laughs> okay. Well, good afternoon or good evening, everybody, depending upon where you are in the country or the world. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. <laughs> I like that, Barbara. That's a good look. Um, and we're delighted to have three. I think this is the most, uh, this is the, the biggest number of U vowels we've ever had in one particular program. Um, <laughs> joining us today is uh, Heather Gudenkoff, and she has her brand new book called Everyone is Watching. And uh, Heather very kindly signed a batch of books and gave us these cool bookmarks. And uh, let's see. And then we also have Mary Kabika. And this is her brand new book, She's Not Sorry, also signed. Here we go. And finally, Lisa Unger. Uh, her brand new book is called The New Couple in 5B. And we have signed copies of that as well. And I will go ahead and put link uh, links to all three of the books in the comments field on Facebook and YouTube, should you wish to purchase them. And also, if you have questions for our authors today, go ahead and put them in. And Barbara will bring me back on screen towards the end of the hour, uh, and I'd be happy to ask any questions you might have. So that is the end of my spiel. Over to Barbara. Thank you very much, Patrick. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm holding them up because there's several fun things to we all have in common this evening. But I want you to look at the colors because these are three different books, but the there's a heavy, what would we call this cover? I mean, color. Lisa, what is this? I, I kind of think it's a magenta or like a, yeah, like a magenta, I'm going to say. That's the, that's the color I'm going with. Mary's is probably the strongest. Notice that I am dressed to match. And notice that by just chance, Heather and Lisa are dressed to match. And Mary is a somber <laughs> black as the background. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't get the memo. And then look at Heather. So the same gorgeous yeah. color. I love it. So um, that's one thing all these books have in common. Another thing is they come from the same publishing house, HarperCollins. And third, which none of you will care about, but I do, they all have the same publicist, Emer. So thank you very much, Emer, for setting all this up. And then thematically, I think they're structurally and thematically, there is a thing that they all have in common. Thematically, revenge is a very powerful driver for all three stories, but in different ways. And structurally, all three of them take place in some kind of closed environment. So mm -hmm. with Heather, it's an estate where a game show is being run. And with Mary, we're in the ER, um, mostly in the ER. And with Lisa, we are in an apartment building in New York. And so in a way, it's kind of an Agatha Christie expanded into a thriller. So did you guys all come to this separately or did you have a conference with Emer and decide you were all <laughs> going to write books along these lines so Heather what do you think well we did not have a conference with Emer as much as we love him and uh, love you know his help and input um no I just think you know there in writing thrillers there's just something so intriguing about being locked in a certain place that may be familiar may not be and you are just bombarded by this mystery, this thriller aspect where you're, you don't know if you're coming or going. And when you're so isolated, you, you know, you feel claustrophobic, you feel trapped. And so that really lends itself to the th thriller genre. I think it might be fair to say too, that if someone is targeting someone else, a place like that is the ideal because then they can't run. They're there, right? So, Mary, I thought your book was truly terrifying, um, mostly because I don't ever want to be in the ER again, having read it. Uh, Mary's book is not actually on sale till April 2nd, but um, but we do have signed copies that are working at the store, and you can order one in advance. So, Mary, what do you think? Uh, why the ER? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that hospitals are are pretty creepy settings. And there is that sense of, you know, you're being cared for and surrounded by people that you don't know, and vice versa, the people that are, you know, the nurses and the doctors, they really don't know the people that they're caring for at all either. So there's this sense of you have to have trust in these other, in these people, but you don't know whether or not you should trust them. And so there's that for one. And then there's just for, you know, the, the people that are patients, there's that sort of locked room 
you know, thing going on, you can't leave. And so there's just that sense of you're sort of giving yourself over, you're trusting people, it's sort of a loss of freedom, you're feeling incredibly vulnerable. So I think that that makes it really, it can make it feel like a very unsafe place to be. Very true. And as somebody who actually survived a long stay in the ER and then ICU once upon a time, what I learned is that you don't get to choose the people that mm. care for you. You really right. are. You know, I mean, it's true that they don't get to choose you, but um, additionally, you don't get to choose them. So that can indeed make you very vulnerable either to intentional harm or to unintentional, but nonetheless, terrible harm. Yeah, you're absolutely at their mercy. You really are. Yep. Um, Lisa, I loved I loved this book. And what I really liked at the end was reading your afterword about uh -huh. why you happened to write this particular book. So <laughs> when you're reading it, don't cheat. It'll ruin it for you. But um, I do urge you. Um, actually, we don't even have that many copies of the new couple in 5B left because this book came out on March 5th. So mm -hmm. we've had it for a while. Um you want to tell us just a little bit about your personal story that won't spoil it? I will. So, yeah. So I, for, usually there's like one germ or one seed that like leads me to research. And then from that research, I tend to hear a voice, like character voice. But in this case, it was more like a collision of a couple of things. And one of the things was this piece that I brought forward from my childhood. My aunt lived in a very beautiful apartment in New York City when I was a kid and it was in like one of these beautiful pre-war buildings on Park Avenue with an awning and a, a you know, a, um, a manually operated elevator and, you know, everything that is actually sort of comes alive in the Windermere is from my memories of that building and her apartment. And it was like this incredibly beautiful space. And as a kid, it felt like that kind of like iconic New York City dream apartment and um, yet my aunt was a very complicated woman. So visits with her were always really layered. And so this piece that I brought forward from that part of my life was that like to be in a beautiful place that you want to feel comfortable, but that there's an undercurrent of something dark and unpredictable. And so that piece kind of always stayed with me. And then a couple of years ago, I had occasion to reread um, Rosemary's Baby by Ira Levin, which is like an iconic novel and, you know, one of my all time favorite novels. But I read it again, like as an adult, whereas, you know, I had one of the first time I read it, I was like a, a, a young person, probably way too young, the way I read most, read most books, right? Way too young. And um and there was a piece from that that kind of collided with my own sort of memory of this New York City place. And so that was sort of the the two, you know, sort of pieces that unified to um, explode into the new couple of 5B in my brain. <laughs> the way things well, work. It's, yeah, it's a wonderful setting. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. My husband grew up on Park Avenue. And we sold our, our apartment at 57th and Park in 20, 2008, actually. Oh, wow. um, but I remember how wonderful those old buildings were. I also remember making a mistake the first time I went there of gathering up some laundry and writing it down in the front elevator and not the service <laughs> elevator. And getting, you know, it's just, oh, it was awful. I mean, it was <laughs> terrible stairs and the doorman scolding me. And, you know, it's like, whoops, what happened here? But anyway, they're special worlds, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And Murray Hill, I think, is just kind of um, that neighborhood in New York just has like a very old New York vibe. Like, you know, every neighborhood in New York City has a different personality. Mm -hmm. And I always think of Murray Hill as being like, you know, just kind of very rarefied and special, um, even though like I think these days it's probably you know, it's not like chic, like Tribeca or hip, like the village, but, you know, it has to like a special old New York charm. Well, New York neighborhoods, you know, it's like a carousel anyway. They right. come and go exactly. and revolve. But so, so Heather, um, I love the title. Everyone is watching. It's so perfect for um, people who are competing on a reality TV show. I mean, brilliant title. Um, what, what, why don't you tell us what your book is about? Give us the pitch. Sure. So it's the story of five strangers who all receive an invitation to take part in this over-the-top reality competition series called One Lucky Winner. And so they all travel to wine country, California, to this remote estate. 
and when they get there, they have to give up their phones. They have to, you know, they've agreed not to have contact with the outside world. And once the game starts, uh, they start playing the game, they, you know, very quickly realize that this wasn't what they thought they signed up for, but right. they're so desperate. They all have their different reasons for needing this money. And it's a large pot of money. It's $10 million. And as the game begins, secrets that they thought they had well hidden uh, from their past slowly start to emerge and the whole world is watching. So it's scary. being live streamed, live streamed across the world. <laughs> so, you know, I think you you mentioned the histories of all the people and then, I mean, briefly, of all the people who are invited to this estate to take part in it. And then, you know, you plant seeds for us to guess why they might be there, right? Right, right. So they, they come from every walk of life. Uh, we have a mom from Iowa, uh, imagine that. And we yeah. have um, a, 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 an attorney from Atlanta, a psychiatrist from the, the, the Bay Area. We have a, um, a an executive from New York. And so they all come together and then they realize they, you know, they have some things in common. Um, some familiar faces show up that they thought maybe wouldn't. And uh, these yeah. secrets slowly start to be revealed, but they're stuck in this game. So the game almost starts to um, become the villain itself. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have to wait to find out who survives, who is in the end, the one lucky winner. I thought it was pretty clever of you to manage to introduce Iowa into a setting in Northern California. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my last, my last nine books have all been squarely set in Iowa and for this book to work, I really needed to take a step out of my home state. And, uh, and yeah, it was a lot of fun, a little de departure for me, but a, a lot of fun to write. I can imagine. So Lisa, you said you just read this book. You, you know, what was your reaction? Yeah, I loved how current it was. I loved, you know, I love that idea of, you know, the and, and it's actually, it's funny because it has some things in common with the, my next book, but I, I really love how, you know, there's this new way of like this is new like sort of doorway of perception that we all have which is like watching things on live stream like doing what we're doing now and being used to watching things on a computer and seeing a list of you know sort of comments and and um you know outside observations coming down i'm always like very interested in technology and how it changes the way we perceive each other and how we interact with each other and so i love that part of of your book heather and um it was like very just sort of gripping and all these different perspectives and um it was really very exciting it is very exciting. And you know, what's interesting is I read this back to back with Claire McIntosh's new book because she's coming to see us in April. And again, it is a a um, TV reality show set up in remote rural Wales. Um, but what's interesting is how different they are. You know, you would think, OK, it's the same setup. But Heather's book and Claire's book are so dramatically different. And, you know, I love the way that you authors can bring so much difference in characters and whatever it is to more or less the same general design, right? Yeah. Right. And yeah. It, yeah. It's really interesting too when there's like there's something that's like sort of, you know, captured the imagination, like the cultural imagination in that moment. And then we sometimes we it seems like a lot of different people pick up on it at the same time and then what they bring to it you know add something completely fresh and original which i think is you know that's kind of the joy of writing right or actually having yeah. friends that are writing because you get to read their stuff and you're like wow <laughs> that's really cool yeah and i think ruth ruth ware has one coming out that's kind of based on a reality right. yep. show some and last show. year yeah. there was a, a really sweet introductory book i mean debut called the golden spoon by jessa maxwell who actually is an editor at salmon and schuster and it involved a reality cooking show and mm -hmm. you know but same thing you know the old house and the remote setting and you mm -hmm. know but but that brings me to a question for mary i mean in your case these people are i mean they apply but but they're more or less picked but in Mary's case, um, 
the people in the ER are not there because they elected to be or because anybody picked them to be. So how far did you have to work in coincidence to make your plot work, Mary? You know, I it was... Um, gosh, <laughs> these books are always so hard to talk about without giving too much away. <laughs> we should um, be doing this next year for these right? books. I don't know. Um, so, you know, it's, it was not too hard actually to work in, in, um, that, you know, like you say, you know, you don't, you don't choose to be in, in a hospital that, you know, th this, this patient ends up there by circumstance. What happens is, um, that our main character is an ICU nurse and she ends up taking care of a patient who arrives in the ICU. Um, it's believed that she jumped from a from a pedestrian bridge in a suicide attempt. And um, as the this this nurse, Megan, gets to know the patients and, um, well, the patient's in a coma, but she gets to know the people who come to visit her. Um, she kind of inadvertently lets herself get too close. She's always sort of drawn a line, not let herself get too emotionally attached to patients or her fa their families that come to visit. But with this patient, she kind of crosses that line and does. And then over time, it becomes more and more evident that the patient was p potentially pushed from a bridge and that she didn't jump. And so now this nurse is wondering, you know, how close she's gotten to the wrong people. So um, there didn't have to be, you know, this, they just kind of end up at this hospital by chance. Um, so there didn't have to be like too much circumstance to pull these characters together. You know, this book reminded me, I've never been able to read a book since it happened. Years ago, Ridley Pearson wrote a book in which, I think it was Ridley, involves somebody who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. And in all of his research, God, maybe it was Marsha Muller now that I think about it. Well, anyway, wherever it was in San Francisco, in all of their research, they discovered that not a single person had ever jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge facing the ocean. 100% how are facing San Francisco when they go, they can tell. And I think that says a lot of things, you know, um, about even if you're choosing to end your life, you don't want to stare into the void looking out, you know, so over the bridge. I mean, I went to college there, so I spent a lot of time under and around the Golden Gate Bridge because we used to go up and ride ferries and all. And it really is a complete difference if you're facing the city or if you're facing, you know, that fairly narrow gap that the bridge spans. But so I thought about that when, you know, when you, this woman may have jumped off a pedestrian bridge, you know, and my first question was, which way was she facing? You know? It's actually <laughs> funny you say that because there's, I, I modeled, there's a bridge, a pedestrian bridge in Chicago, the story set in Chicago that goes over a rail yard. And, um, you know, once I sort of had the setting for the story and I, I found, you know, a bridge that I wanted to use as my inspiration, I drove to the city, you know, and I went and I stood on the bridge and one side, it's about a couple miles south of um, the loop in Chicago. And so one direction faces the loop and the other, you know, for, you know, faces further south in the city. And I always pictured her, you know, looking towards the city, towards the skyline and jumping in that direction. So it's funny. It is interesting. I grew up in Chicago, so it was fun. Um, there's been a little bit of a movement towards more Midwestern set mysteries recently. You know, for a long time, there was this kind of void and we only had Sarah Bereski writing about, you know, or a couple of people writing about Chicago. But now there's a group, you know, we have Iowa, we have Wisconsin, we have, you know, Minnesota, we have now another Chicago book. So I think that's great. I, I do. I do, too. And I mean, I personally love to read a book that's set, you know, in an area that I'm familiar with. And I know a lot of readers have said the same thing. And Heather, I love how even when you have a book set outside of Iowa, your characters <laughs> or a character still has a connection to Iowa. Absolutely. So, Lisa, what what you want to give us a pitch? You sort of told us about the yeah. couple in 5B, but tell us more. Yeah. So when you first open the new couple, um, you meet Rosie and Chad. And um, they're a young couple and they are, you know, they're struggling everything, all their, their luck is all bad right now. Like she's, she's struggling with her book proposal. She's a true crime writer. Chad is an actor and he's having trouble finding a role that, that means something to him. And they're, you know, they're both, they're trying to start a family and things are just not going well. They've just lost, um, Chad's uncle, who is like their only like sort of close family member. So they're kind of in a bad place. And then they receive a surprise inheritance of a dream a dream apartment in an iconic New York City building. And they think that they're going to move in here and 
this is the moment where their luck starts to change. Um, but of course, you know, not. <laughs> and so um, as soon as they start, they move into the window mirror, strange things start to happen. And when Rosie's neighbor winds up dead, she knows that she has to sort of dig into the dark secrets of the window mirror before she and her husband also fall under its spell. So money plays a role in all these books, but yeah. um, inheritance, I think, is... You know, it's, it's fry. I just looked at a book called The Inheritance by somebody, I can't even remember, um, and about the traumas that can come with inheritance and disputed yeah. inheritances and so forth. So um, you could have you could have gotten them the apartment other ways, right? But why did you choose inheritance? <laughs> well, we you can't know, I, say, I don't right? know that I did. I don't know that I did choose it. I feel like it kind of chose me, like, which is the way I feel about a lot of things in my book. I mean, I like the idea of, you know, them that, you know, so um, Chad and Rosie took care of Ivan as he was was dying. And he has a daughter who, um, you know, wants nothing to do with him. They're completely estranged. Um, but, you know, Rosie and Chad still think the apartment is going to his daughter, Dana. And they're, so they're, but that's, so that's not why they're taking care of him. You know, they're taking care of him because they love him and they, you know, want to ease, you know, his final days. And so they're very shocked when they get this apartment. And I kind of like the idea of that surprise of receiving an apartment. And then it kind of, when they do, it kind of highlights the differences between them. Like, you know, he's very excited to be receiving this and she's kind of like more cautious. Like, can we even afford to inherit this? Like, what's the tax situation? Shouldn't we sell it and start our new life? Like, she's more of like a, she's more like me. <laughs> like she's going to analyze, you know, everything. And so I like the way the surprise boon kind of created fissures in their relationship really early on. It's different when you work together to buy something and, you know, there's like all these decisions that are made, but when something is given to you, I think there's a different energy to that. So I was interested to explore that. Absolutely. So, you know, money is somewhere or other books set in New York, money always seems to be more desperate. Maybe, you know, Heather, you probably could have a character survive in Iowa with very little money. I mean, you know, that's not New York City. but it, it seems like people not in New York, York City. No, people in New York, um, and they're almost always in financial difficulties because so unbelievably expensive to live there. Yeah. Hence, we sold our apartment. But anyway, right. um, it, it's a real survival thing. I mean, you know, in New York, if you really are broke, there's not a lot of there are not a lot of options. No. Yeah. No. And it's, it's definitely, you know, there's like kind of a, like I've, you know, my, all my family is from New York. I grew up in the tri-state area uh, for part of the time. And um, I lived in New York city for a long time. I went to, I went to NYU. I worked in publishing. And so I have this like relationship with New York city that, you know, sort of finds its way onto the page pretty often. It's like, there's a New York city that kind of only belongs to me. It's like, you know, my memories of it, my imagination of it, my experience with it now. But one of the things about New York City is that, you know, it is, it's a hard go to live there. It's like, you know, daily kind of punch in the face, you know, as much as you love it, there's like, you know, there's something about it that like, just kind of takes everything from you at the same time. So um, it's a very complicated relationship with the city and anybody who lives there for a long time has that, I think has that, you know, same kind of complicated relationship with the city. Even if you Lisa, have it's like you're, oh. sorry. No, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, Lisa, it's like, it's your Gotham, right? <laughs> that New York is your Gotham and that in Chicago is Mary's. And so I know as I was reading your books, uh, just your sense of place was just, you know, I told Mary before, I just, and I feel the same way about yours, Lisa. I feel like uh, you took me on a tour of your town in, through the book. And that is, becomes a character in itself. And I really enjoy that as a reader. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I definitely feel that way. It's definitely like, you know, it's Gotham in that way for me that it's like larger than life. Like there's part, there's pieces of it in my fiction that are, you know, just kind of bigger than they are in real life. And then also, you know, my fictional town, the hollows is like adjacent to New York city. It's like, you know, you know, it's like as far away from New York city as it possibly could be energetically, like it might as well be on the moon, but they're connected in a weird way. And some of the stories are connected between those two places, like Crazy Love You. 
Um, so it's definitely someplace I return to again and again, and it's part fiction and part real. Yeah. So I never assumed that you all have read each other's books, but it sounds like you might have. So why don't we, why don't I now back out and Heather, why don't you tell us about you know, more about why you like Lisa's book and Mary's book. And oh the my gosh. Mm-hmm. Well, I could go on for, for days and days, but, you know, I think for, for, you know, both of them and what I admire so much about uh, both Mary and, and Lisa as, as authors is they, they just pull us into the story that, you know, we get the setting, which is very, um, you know, very, tangible I think as as a reader but also the characters you know they're they're very relatable um for sure and getting to know you know Rosie with with being a um a journalist and and just um for Mary the nurse I could I could really connect with with those characters and I think that's such a huge part of writing beyond writing thrillers if readers aren't connected to the characters they don't care how fast paced it is. They don't care about the twists and turns. They need to get to know the characters inside and out. And and that's what I really appreciate about, about this, both these books. Thank you, Heather. I would say the exact same thing about Lisa and Heather's books. I feel like a lot of times thrillers, you know, there, there's so much about the pacing and keeping everything just so fast paced that sometimes they can come across a little, a little cold, you know, it's all about the pacing Mm -hmm. and less about the character developments and the atmosphere and things like that. But, um, you know, a lot of times people ask me, well, what makes a good thriller? And I think that you really, for me, for me, I want to have that emotional attachment. I want to really care about those characters and I want to see them through this whole journey, see them through to the end to see what happens. I just want to be really, really invested in their lives and in their story. And that's what Heather and Lisa's characters do to me. I'm just so drawn in and they're so atmospheric. And, and you know, the way you do it, you do it in such a way like Heather, you know, you have all these characters in the story, all the, all the ones, you know, on the reality show, but, and you introduce us to each them, each of them, you know, we get to know them, but it never takes away from the pacing of the book. You know, I feel like the pacing is still incredible. You know, both of your books, I was flipping through the pages, could not put them down. So you just, it's like the perfect balance of the character, the atmosphere and that pacing. So they're perfect thrillers in my my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. I feel the same way as well about your work, you know, and I love how Um, Well, it's every, you know, we're all really different. We're all doing like really different things, but, you know, we're all very like sort of keyed in to like the character, the atmosphere. And also what I think I love about, about Mary and Heather's books is that they, they kind of understand that like, well, like in publishing, there's like the idea of like the big stakes, right? Like the fate of the free world hangs in the balance or like, you know, the hero is rushing to save the day. But I think that we all know that the biggest stakes are the smallest stakes, right? Like the things that keep us up at night and the things that make us do things that maybe are, you know, not wise or, you know, very like sort of thriller-esque, right? Or because we care so much about the people that we love and that each of the characters in, in Heather's books and Mary's book, they always have like these secret drivers, right? Like there's, you know, the there's like the heart of each character and the thing that they want is so is such a strong driver that it just really drives the plot. And I really feel totally immersed in, in both of the books. I know that when I get my when I get my books in the mail from Emer, <laughs> from Heather and Mary, Emer. I'm always like super excited because I'm like, great. Now I can like just sit and like read, you know, these books written by my friends and writers that I admire and just, you know, enjoy the ride that they have created. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what makes them so special too, is knowing both of you personally, you know, and it's, I mean, the minute one of your books arrives in my mail, I'm, you know, setting everything else aside to read it, but just having that personal connection, knowing you, I mean, it makes it that much more special of an experience, I think. Absolutely. Great. So I can tell you that I have customers who many times will say to me, I love this author, but I don't want to come to the event because I I love the work, but I don't want to come to the event in case I decide I don't like the author, you know, which would then taint my, I'm serious, you know, would then taint my reading. And, And I do think, I mean, that's, that's the advantage and disadvantage of doing public events, you know, is that, I mean, we all know authors who, 
people love the author so much that what they have written is not nearly as critical times <laughs> as you know it's just them um and and then I, it, it's just an it's an interesting thing to watch we have a lot of people that fly in for our events you know because we're so far west that lots of times it's the farthest that anybody's going to come so we have regular commuters from Las Vegas and San Diego and Albuquerque and, you know, Southern New Mexico. And we had two ladies who flew down from Seattle to meet El Cosimano. And oh, yeah. Great. They were, yeah. Well, when I say two ladies, they were really an interesting pair. They were young, they were robust, and they were tattooed from their foreheads to their ankles. And okay. wore That's very funny. little clothing as a result because the idea was to show off the tattoos. Yeah, to show off all those tattoos, right? Yeah. yeah. And I thought, you know, I mean, it was it was really fun to see, you know, mm -hmm. to see them. And I love that that we get these interesting mixes of fans. Um, yeah. you know, some of whom are really personally so affected, deeply affected in their lives by, I've done a lot of events with Janet Ivanovich. I mean, we've been together for, you know, since one for the money. And I have heard so many stories for her, for Diana Gabaldon and other authors that how their works helped people get through terrible times in their lives, you know, comforted them, made them laugh, you know, all these others. There's a real oh, bond that forms oftentimes between readers and writers or writers' characters. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's like such a magical thing about, you know, the the writer-reader relationship. Like I always feel like I write my book and, you know, there's a first draft that's just that's just for me, right? Like that's the the story as it as it evolves in the writing. And then there's the second draft and the third and the fourth and the fifth. And those drafts are for the reader, you know, like to bring the reader along for the ride that I was on in the first draft, you know, to make sure that they're getting everything that they need from the story. And then when the book goes out into the world and it winds up in other people's hands, which is such an incredible gift, right? Like, you know, to, I've never wanted to do anything else like since I was a kid. So the idea that I write a story and then it winds up being read by other people is still to me like kind of a map kind of a magical thing. I'm so grateful. But like that reader then takes the book and that book becomes belong belongs to that reader. Exactly. And they bring something special to the story and they they take from the story things that are unique to them. And then when you can go be out on the road and talking to people and having that connection with them and understanding what, what the book meant to them and how you know it affected them. Like that is such a, a magical relationship. And I think it's, you know, it's like there's an idea that like, oh, you know, you're the writer and you write for yourself, but you, we don't, you know, we write for our readers. Right. They become such touchstones. Like I know for me in certain times in my life, uh, books become touchstones. So when my son was really ill, The Help, I read The Help while I was in the hospital with him. And that book will always be kind of a comfort book to me because, right. you know, because of that timing. And my, my dad who passed away last year was such a huge fan of CJ Box. Mm. and Lee Child that that's our like that was our touchstone together were, were the CJ Box books and the Lee Child books so I think that's just the magic of it too is how um, you know it, it memories and situational and yeah and how amazing is it that people are flying in to see authors like rock stars I mean Absolutely. books are alive and well that just is so heartwarming to hear you know, yeah. So. yeah, I, agree. I have to say that when I started a bookstore, it would never have occurred to me that it was really going to be not about books as much as it was going to be about these relationships. I mean, the books are the foundation of it. I don't mean that it's not about the books, but right. I did not really. I we we I've been very fortunate that people write reviews for the store all the time, and I think we've only had one that wasn't a five star review. But what I love is what they say about the staff and about what you know, um, what the experience of coming there and so forth means to them. And then every once in a while, which I think is really fun, I'll be doing an event with an author, and somebody will ask a question, and I get this wild eyed look from the author, like did I really write that? Or did I say that? Or how did this reader ever get to that? You know, <laughs> it could be really fun. 
So, um, you know, it's, it's been an incredibly rewarding thing. So I have a writerly question to ask you now, which is, in every one of your books, um, where it is, the landscape of the book is critical to the story. So do you do you start with the landscape and find the story or do you start with the story and find the landscape or does it vary every single time? Mary, what about you? You know, I, it, for the most part, the way I write, it can, it can vary. I guess She's Not Sorry was really kind of an outlier from some of my other books. Most of my other books, I, I start, I start just with a mystery, you know, something, someone has gone missing or, you know, someone body has turned up, something like that, you know, that I, I start there and I am not at all a plotter. So I go in usually just with that starting point and I introduce my characters. I, I get to know my characters through the writing process. And as I get to know them, I sort of solve this mystery alongside them. I almost never know what my twist is going to be as you know, it's I'm like maybe a third of the way into it or even more before I really start to figure out what that twist is going to be. So, um, you know, I that's that's the way it goes with She's Not Sorry, though. It was different. It was it was one of only two books where I actually thought of the twist first. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I thought of it, it wasn't a fully formed twist. I, I thought of it was it was um kind of just a concept, really, you know, sort of one of those things that I, I wanted to do, sort of a feeling that I wanted to, to, to kind of get out of my readers. And I started with that, started to think it through and figure out how am I going to make this work? And then I took a step back and actually created the story that was going to work with that twist, created the story, figured out who my characters were going to be. And so it was a totally different writing experience to have that endpoint in mind and be starting you know, from a different point and trying to work my way there instead of, you know, knowing that starting point and figuring out the the twist as I went along. Mm -hmm. Heather? Yeah, for me, I am very much a pantser. Historically, my books, I, I have a general idea of where I want the story to go and I start writing and um, I end up going all over the place and thank goodness for second, third and fourth and fifth drafts. I mean, um, yeah, I write, I say I write ugly. I write very ugly. And then somehow um, am able to eventually to corral it in with the help of a, an incredible editor <laughs> that we also we, all three We share. have the same editor, all three we of us. have the same editor. <laughs> <laughs> the same publicist and the same editor. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I write myself into a lot of corners and, um, but I, there's, there is kind of something magical about that too, even writing yourself into corners because you surprise yourself. And I love that about um, the writing process when something pops up and um, you surprise yourself as the writer because you know it's probably going to surprise the reader as well. But it's not the most efficient way of writing for, I mean, I found. And so yeah. my next project, I am trying to plot it out a little bit more. And that I'm working on and but still the characters tend to take over I don't know if that's the same for you for you ladies but I, I had a little plan in mind and the, the characters just kind of decide to do their own thing anyway they do that and I'm just like you Heather I'm a messy messy writer and I always think that if I would take the time to plot that you know it wouldn't be so messy but I, I love like the spontaneity of not knowing what's going to happen every day and I think you learn so much about your characters by going the wrong direction and then even if you have to delete chunks and go back I think you learn a lot about the the characters and the story that way. Yeah, I mean, it's the same for me. All plot flows from characters. If there's no character voice, like that's, there's no book, you know, like, because I'll have this like obsession with an idea and it'll lead to a lot of research, but I'm obsessed with a lot of things. I do a lot of research. <laughs> I'm a, like an information junkie. But when there's a voice, when I start hearing that voice, then I know, or voices, then I know that there's a book and the story evolves for me on the page very much in the way it will for my reader. Um, you know, like I write for the same reason that I read because I want to know what's going to happen, you know, to the people living in my head. And I, and, and that's how I've written every, every, every single novel and short story and novella over the last, you know, 20 something years. And, um, and that, that's part of the joy of it. Like, I feel like if I knew how the book was going to end, like, why would I even, why would I even write it? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like all, all the excitement and the engine that drives the book and getting to know the characters and, and having people sort of show up on the page and like, oh my God, who is this? Or oh, wow, this character from another book is here now. And like, you know, having that kind of magical event, you know, occurring on my computer or my notebook every day is, I mean, a big part of the joy of it for me. And I feel like, you know, we've talked a little bit here about like, you know, plot, pacing, character, setting, right? Like, of course, it's everything, you know, it has to be all of those things. But if people don't care about your characters, you could have the best plot, the highest stakes, you know, the best twist. But if they don't, if they didn't care from that very first page about that character, then the, they, they don't care about the book. I really believe that. So all plot flows from character for me. I love it. That's an excellent line. I wish we could call Patrick up to see if we have any questions from the audience. Right, Patrick, pop in. I love this. It's sort of like staging, you know, there he goes. <laughs> right. Here I am. Yeah. Here you are. It's been a great discussion. And um, have a lot. let me see if I can get a, a hold on some of these questions. Um, uh, our friend Robin, who's a regular a viewer, is going to be at Left Coast Barbara, and she says she's looking forward to meeting you, but she's nervous. Uh, <laughs> I said, don't be nervous. She'll be happy to meet you. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. Oh, this is good. Uh, Robin says, one of you should write a thriller involving house squatters. Which could mm. be fun. great, great idea. idea. <laughs> They're actually well, I'm, I'm saying, so. yeah. <laughs> Mary Clean <laughs> <laughs> Um let's see here. What else do we have? Uh Julia would like to know, she says, authors, would you consider a sequel or follow-up to the to your latest novels? Or are they all gonna be standalones? Yeah. So mine is definitely a standalone. I feel I feel like at the end of really all of my books that exist, like I have destroyed everybody's life enough that <laughs> I don't know that there's, that I can continue. Um, I do sometimes say the good girl, there's a detective, um, uh, Gabe Hoffman. And I think it would be fun to do like a spinoff with him, you know, just have him solving some other mystery. Um, but I think for as, as for a sequel, I, I don't really know that there would be for most of my books, like much to work with to go, to go on to another one. Yeah, I have uh, I have a couple of books that are sort of connected by place and character. And actually, in the new couple, there's a character who has been in a few other books. So I I tend to like I do have um, you know a couple books that are you know series, but they these are mostly they're just kind of you know chain linked in some way a lot of my books that involve the hollows are chain linked by place and character so i never really know who's going to come forward you know usually if i leave somebody in a really bad place and then i'm like super worried about them afterwards and i'm like still kind of thinking about them and i'm like okay i'm going to you know i'm going to advance their arc in the you know in the next story or they just kind of show up and they have something to do and I'm, you know, happy to see them. So it's really very organic. I don't really know, you know, whether there would be another, you know, another chapter for this book, but I'm sure there's a character that will go yeah. off again. I like Me that. Too. Sorry, the puppies were beating down the door. <laughs> Here they are. Okay. Uh, you have to let them in. You can't keep them out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for me, I, you know, every book, I say to my editor, to Erica, I'll say, can this be a series? Because I love reading series. I, I love being immersed in, in these continuous things. And it never works out because like, I'm like, like Mary, I destroy all these lives and we, you know, tend to wrap everything up. Oh, very <laughs> cute. I so I don't think there are any series in my, my future anytime soon, but uh, you know, maybe someday. Yeah. Good luck com competing with that, Heather. I'm sorry, Heather. What's I know that's okay. Dogs, hey, and that, dogs all right, day. Every day. Get down. Come here. Come on. Your turn. Come on. Trouble. Come on, trouble. Uh, they're twins. Oh, well, not twins, but they are literally. Oh, 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 this is trouble. Oh, sweet. Oh, my gosh. Isn't she a good girl? Yeah. Oh, yes, I know. Okay. <laughs> and you can go wrestle each other. 
So right. I don't remember yeah. that little there you go. Do you have a little bit of white here, Barbara? Or what she is has that? a little tuxedo down down her front and then she has a little hey, that's enough. I never noticed. Oh wait. Sorry. Now you want to see. <laughs> that's not gonna happen. <laughs> Well, you since we're kind of Heather, on the I'm top. truly sorry. Did I'm, I'm sure you were saying something fabulous that got completely. No, and there's nothing. There's nothing more fabulous than dogs. And I believe. I mean, believe you me. So I will stop for a dog any day. <laughs> well, since You're we're okay, on the topic, um, and I know we have some people watching that are big time animal lovers. Uh, what all three of you? What what's your relationship with, like with animals? Do you have pets? Oh yeah. So I have, I have Jack, Jack, he's actually in bed right now. He's like kind of an old man. We actually put him to bed at night. Like he goes to bed at like around seven <laughs> So he's right behind me on the couch, but now he, he needs to go to bed earlier. So, um, he's a, he's a 12 year old Labradoodle, uh, Australian Labradoodle. And he is absolutely 100% my shadow. He, um, he's my writing buddy and, you know, just like the sweetest, the sweetest dog. Um, so, and he's, you know, always has his, his social media time. So if you, if you're looking for an, you know, some images of Jack, Jack, they are, they are copious. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> he retires to his chambers early though, these days. Yeah, he's just like such an old guy. Now he just is like done. He's like, I, he, he's like on so many medications. Does, <laughs> so he, take him, does he take himself to bed? <laughs> no, we take, we have to take him to bed. We have to put him to bed, you know, the two of us, like as if he were, we, we refer to him these days as our elderly toddler, <laughs> which is basically how he is. So yeah, we put him to bed like a, like a baby in our bed. Of course, that's his bed. <laughs> so Heather? Yeah. So I have Lolo. Lolo is a, a German chef or German short hair pointer, and she is 11 years old. And so she's getting up there as well. And uh, she is my shadow, my sidekick, yeah. um, you know, has her little spot in my office at all times. And it's just the sweetest, sweetest thing ever. Yeah, she's a good girl. So we, I love dogs. I have to say first day, I grew up with a dog. I love dogs, but we have cats. Um, and ours are actually getting up there in age too. We have three of our own cats and a very spoiled guinea pig. Um, but our cats are, <laughs> are, 18 and then two are, are 16 and then even our guinea wow. pig is seven so everybody's getting up there in years and wow. then um <laughs> and then lots of medication for everyone <laughs> except the guinea pig just want to love for him um and then we foster cats and kittens as well we don't have any right now but it's like getting into kitten season so right after book tour i'm going to be asking for a litter of kittens because i'm ready for them Awesome. Oh, you. That's wonderful. That's we have a new program here where you can take a dog from a shelter for a day and, you know, walk it around or yeah. <clears throat> Rob is resisting it because he said that three dogs is all we're allowed here in our community. And he's yeah. pretty sure that if we took a dog for a day that, you know, not it would back. not go back to the <laughs> shelter. So no, I, it, that's a great program, though. I mean, it's so good for them to get out really of the yeah. for a little bit here and there. I agree. Any other questions, Patrick? Yeah, let's see. Um, sorry for taking us down that rabbit hole, but I think it's fun yeah. to talk about the animals. It is fun. Um, okay, Gail would like to know, how do you all have time to read with all the writing you do? Excellent question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we're all readers first, right? I mean, this is where we fall in love with story in the pages of somebody else's book. And, you know, I, I, my mom was a librarian and I've just been an avid reader all my life. And I just can't imagine a life without stories. And I think that, you know, it, that's where you kind of, as a writer, it's where you recharge your writer batteries is by reading the works of people that you admire. Um, so I feel like it's just, for me, it's just kind of a continuum of reading, writing, researching, you know, it's like a loop that I'm on. So I just feel like there's, you know, it's part of, it's part of my, it's part of my life, you know, reading is part of my life as a writer. Yeah. 
I agree. And it's usually for me, it's like, honestly, how I reward myself once I reach my word count for the day, then I can switch from writing to reading. And I'm one of those people that I just sort of always have a book with me. So if I'm in the school pickup line or whatever, you know, I've got a book there that I'm reading. I also in the last couple of years started going more towards audiobooks too, which are, it's just a great way to be able to multitask. If I'm taking a walk or cleaning the house or whatever, I can listen to the books. Yeah. Same, same, the best part of the day the end of the day when I can put everything else aside and, and pull out my books. Mm -hmm. Do you cleanse the palate with uh, something completely outside of what you normally do? Or do you usually read in your own genre? I hit like this genre is definitely my favorite, but I, um, you know, sometimes you're right in the middle of a book and you need some, you're writing a book, you know, and you need something totally mm -hmm. different. So then historical fiction is my number two go-to genre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read a lot. I read, a, a you know, all across genre and I read a lot of nonfiction as well. Um, yeah, I'm just like looking for a great story. It doesn't matter to me what the what the genre is or something that I'm really interested in. You know, I'm I'm always, you know, uh, that's a kind of a, a palate cleanser for me is just to, you know, be in a nonfiction universe for a while learning. Yeah, and I, I'm one of those people. I usually have two or three books going at one time. So I'll have you know, uh, a thriller book I'm reading, nonfiction. I love reading poetry, historical fiction too. So I always have something going depending on the mood. <laughs> right. I know, Barbara, you have lots of interests that uh, a lot of books you'd love to read, right? That you just don't have time to get to, right? Yep. Actually, I'm a Regency romance junkie. <laughs> Absolutely. I was, you know, Jane Austen from a child. Um, I love biography. Um I'm not so fond of memoirs. I like, I don't know why, but you know, there's a ton of them. I will tell you ladies that since I just did the fall tour grids for all the major publishers, that what I'm seeing is very little in the way of crime and thriller. I'm seeing a ton of romanticy, a ton yeah. of fantasy, and yeah. a lot of memoirs and nonfiction um, it's an in interesting fall driven in part by um, the election and the fact that people will um, maybe be distracted. In, 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 I think historical fiction is also right now a very comforting thing to read since we actually know how things came out. <laughs> um, but um, I do I do think it's going to be a curious fall. Yes. Um, in yes. in that sense, so for some of us, there will be maybe more reading time if we're not terribly interested in the bulk of the offering coming out. But you know, publishing is also has always been driven in part by trend, you know, by demand, by situation. Um, so mm -hmm. one of the things that's so interesting about it is how unpredictable we we like to think it's data driven, but forget it; it really isn't. No. I it is at all. <laughs> you know, I mean, if it were really data driven, I could order the right number of books for everything, but it doesn't work out that way. So, yeah. you know, um, you as writers and me as a bookseller and publishers doing publishing, it's really hard for us to really stay current. You know, I feel like we're always kind of a step. I don't know whether we're a step behind or a step ahead, whatever it is. Right. But readers are ultimately <laughs> <You're so positive. laughs> um, but readers are ultimately the drivers of all that we do, and readers are affected by, you know, what's going on in the real world. And also um It's great to see so many younger people reading again. It you really know, is. I know that we were all we were worried that, oh my gosh, our audience is aging out, you know. Um, yeah, there's there's really this great kind of trend that we're seeing here with younger, you know, mostly female, I think, but not exclusively, of course. Yeah. Um, and they're getting interested in like uh, Goodreads or these mm -hmm. different programs that, you know, they can connect with each other as well as with the books. And I think that's great. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think and book talk has gotten like so huge mm -hmm. in the last couple of years. And I feel like that's probably bringing in a lot of younger readers as well. Right. Yeah, and I noticed on the road, I just got finished with my book tour. I know you guys are just about getting ready to go out on the road, but I noticed on my tour, there were a lot of new young faces in the audience. A lot of people that were like, oh, I discovered your book on Instagram. And, you know, right. they came out and they were super excited. And that was really cool. I was happy to see that. I think that in general, readers are connecting with your social media 
And that's what actually brings them into events. It's not the old, the older publisher driven, you know, right. publicity and marketing thing. It's really largely in your hands um, and to some degree in ours. But um, yeah. it's a little unnerving because sometimes if we have a new author coming to see us where we have, you know, no data whatsoever, um, we have no idea whether five people are going to come or you know, 80 or whatever, it's all a complete surprise because their social media is not visible to us. We right. don't know what, you know, what they're doing. So I find that, um, you know, that really makes it fun to, you have to sort of, you know, go with it, but I like that. <laughs> and we're doing, we're doing some young adult events that I, we have one coming up for Holly Jackson that sold out in a heartbeat. Um, oh, she's great. She's yeah. great. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Well, you know, I wouldn't, I mean, up until now, it's just not been on my radar because we don't, we don't do a lot of young adult, but um, we did a, a big thing for V.E. Schwab last fall and we have, um, I don't know, I mean, it's fun to see, you know, stuff that is new and generated that we might not have gotten to on our own. So yeah. I love that. Yeah. Right. Anything else, Patrick? Yeah, let's see. Um, well, this is a question uh apropos of what we've been talking about barbara do you also think these next slot of books are geared to a younger audience well i think the, the authors can answer that better than i can yeah well, i mean I think are you writing for a younger audience ladies i i don't know that i'm i mean i don't know that i'm necessarily writing for a younger audience i try to stay current you know, um, I always, you know, I'm very interested in what's going on right now in our culture. So I'm very keyed into that and keyed into technology and how, you know, technology is kind of rewriting the way we relate to each other. So those things really interest me. And so I think it's, you know, um, it's, it's young and current in that way. But I think most of us, when we sit down to write, we're not like, oh, I'm writing for a younger audience. You know, we're not even necessarily thinking like, oh, I'm writing mystery thriller. Or, oh, I'm writing this. We just have these characters and we're writing these stories and then how they get stole, how they get sold, how they get put on the shelf is really, is really a question of, you know, publishers and booksellers, like where, you know, who, who are they, you know, who are they marketed towards? Um, so I hope that, you know, that I, that I'm current to what's going on in the world and, and that maybe that, you know, can, can be something that younger readers feel, you know, they can relate to. But when you put your own social media out, Lisa, do you think that it's more younger people are reading Instagram or hitting Instagram and bookstagram and all than older ones? I wish I, I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that. You know, I, I feel like so social media is kind of this thing that, you know, when I when I published my first book back in the Stone Age, you know, the year the year 2002, there was no social media. OK, there was no there was nothing. And over the years, it has just kind of evolved and it's become this this place where, you know, we can really connect with each other. We can connect with booksellers and librarians. And it's really great in that way. But, you know, I have really worked to find, you know, my own voice in a media in, in the medium and just kind of be myself and, and do my own thing. And, you know, entertain and connect and not have it also at the same time, like take over my life. You know, it's just kind of this like, you know, balancing act that I do with social media. So I think that I don't know who necessarily um, is watching. And I, <laughs> and I try I try not to think about that too much. But I think there's a pretty wide range of older readers and younger readers. And I think that's evidenced by when I get out on the road and I'm like connecting with people like, IRL in real life, you know, um, that I see a lot of, you know, a big mix of, of faces. So I think that's, you know, speaks to the social media, maybe um, the books, maybe, or maybe just the culture. Yeah. And I know for me, for social media, it, it is just such a, a great way to connect with fellow readers. Cause I think that's what, you know, I first and foremost, a reader and love talking about books, whether they're mine or, you know, other people's books as well. And as for, um, you know, the ages of the audiences, I, I like, like Lisa, I'd like to try and stay current. A lot of my books come from something in the news spurs, uh, what I write about. But I think also with the characters and how we connect with readers, 
um, I know for me, I have a wide range usually of ages of my characters in my books because they're usually about families or extended families. And so there's a, a voice of a younger person or an elderly person. And I think that's something that readers can connect with. They see themselves in some of the characters. They see um, people they love or don't love in some of the characters as well. So that's a way to kind of span the generations a bit. Yeah. And I, I agree with that. Heather, um, my, she's not sorry, has, um, it has a number of adults, but there's also a 16 year old girl mm -hmm. that's in the story. And so I feel like, um, I don't know that, you know, a younger teenager I would recommend the book for, because there are definitely some adult issues in the book, but I think, you know, older teenagers and, and up would be totally fine with the book. I just recorded a podcast the other day and, um, the woman I was speaking to said her own 17 year old daughter had read it. And um, so, you know, I definitely think that an older teenager would be fine with it. And I think just, you know, it's fun. I think having the teenage character, I think, um, and just the mother daughter dynamics that are in the book, I think that they're going to be very relatable, both to teenagers and to adults. Anything else, Patrick? There's a bunch of stuff. I know we're running out of, out of time. Um, let's see, Sue. Uh, just asks, have any of you read The Women by Kristen Hanna, her new book? Has anybody read it yet? I downloaded the audiobook, but that's, that's like my, <laughs> oh my April goodness. listen. Oh my <laughs> Love Kristen Hanna. She's amazing. I can't wait. I haven't read it yet, but I cannot wait. The Nightingale is like one of my all-time favorites. Yeah, it's a wonderful book. Um, also, a question, question for Lisa specifically about your titles. Are those your titles? Do you, or... <laughs> How does that work? I mean, the <laughs> last four or five have been so cool. Titles are such a complicated thing. This is the only thing I know for sure about titles. If I absolutely have a title for my book that I love, that I know it's the only title that the book could ever be and that my heart is completely set on it, that that will not be the title of my book. <laughs> <laughs> that is the only thing I know for sure. And I can always tell when my editor, our beloved editor, doesn't like my title because when I get the, you know, we start talking about the book, she refers to it as the book or the manuscript, like, and does not refer to it by the title that I have very clearly written on the title page. <laughs> <laughs> but, but luckily, uh, you know, Erica is like, Erica is a brilliant, a brilliant editor and we, she, she's responsible for some of my best titles and Margaret was responsible for, uh, Margaret Marbury. She was responsible for Confessions on the 745. Like that was her title. Um, and you know, the rest of them are all some combination of my idea, Erica's idea, some kind of insane email like chain that goes back and forth for like weeks, like with every different title possible until we come up with one that everybody's like, yes, that's the title. So yeah. <laughs> I thought uh, Secluded I'm, yeah. Cabin Sleep Six was particularly inspired. I, think, I, I, will, I will not take credit for that at all. I think that was completely Erica. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was. I'm the worst at titles. I don't think I've ever had one of my books of my 10 that was a title I, I came up with. It's hard. <laughs> It's hard. It is. It's, hard. it's hard. It really is. It's like, I can tell you what my book is about, but I need a hundred thousand words. To do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do it in three words. I'm really sorry, but somebody luckily is good at that. So thank goodness for a great publisher. I don't even think about titles. I just turn them in as like book two, book three, You're like whatever. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Try, huh? Number 33, whatever. <laughs> New novel. Exactly. But let's face it, the magic is not just the title. The magic is the image. And yeah, the, it's the, and, yeah. And, this particularly, is a and particularly in a in a time when a JPEG really matters, you know, yeah. the image can actually carry it even more than the title. Um yeah, that it's one it's definitely one of my favorite um jackets. It's I've had a lot of really great ones. The building, you know, I mean it's yeah. very, yep, um, very good. Yeah. I think on the, the actual physical book, the uh, the inside is the yeah. inside flaps are all pink, like they're a hot pink, and the type is hot pink, and it is absolutely stunning. And like the cover has like all different purples and blues and blacks in it, and it's just it's just truly gorgeous. So, 
Oh, that's through. depressing. I'm going to have to go down to the bookstore and look at an actual book. Yeah, <laughs> like I just got the advanced <laughs> reading copy, and they don't have yeah. fun stuff. It's very it. special. It's very, I think Patrick has it right there. If you open it, you can see those hot pink mm. inside flaps. They're like oh. really Ooh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness, look I at know. that. I've missed the entire production. It's the same yeah. color as Heather's shirt. <laughs> it is I planned it that way. <laughs> Just for you. She's <laughs> such a good friend. So good. <laughs> is there any secret subliminal stuff in here? Any? Yeah, tons. Masonic symbols? <laughs> Absolutely. Or cool? But I can't tell you what they are because then it wouldn't be a secret. That's true. <laughs> All no, right. they're all they're all really great looking. They, they, are, really they are. are, and I love the common the common color palette, which it I think is so fun. Cool. Yeah. Right, and that yeah, there we go. It's perfect so, for like buying a set of our books. If you buy a set of our books, they're all going to look really good together. Exactly. We should make a box set yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on the go. shelf, and you know, we're the right color. And you heard us all talking, okay. and signed books make wonderful gifts. Oh, I saying. guess one, one last it's question. Um, Mother's Day coming right up, right? Yeah, exactly. Happy Mother's yeah. Day, Mom. <laughs> and the holidays eventually. Um, exactly. Yes, they're all coming down the pike. Uh, the last question, I guess. Um, several people have asked this. Um, well, actually, to interrupt myself, Heather, you're getting a lot of love for Lolo. Uh, mm -hmm. Lolo's trending on the comments here. <laughs> but, um, Lolo had a little bit of a, a illness. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, she, her ear was all swollen. It was the freakiest thing I've ever seen. Oh, so I, yeah, I so like I, a hematoma or something. Yeah, like it's exactly. Well, she looked like Dobby, and um, you know, oh. Dobby the elf on one ear. Took her, and she's perfectly fine. She's been, oh, you know, spoiled the whole day. She's fine, but it was. You have to no work on. She you doesn't. Work? Not no, oh. not yet. So as long as things stay calm with that ear, she'll be okay. But. Keep a close eye on her. But the, the question really is just, um, would you ever, all the three of you ever consider collaborating on something? I mean, a novel, probably not, but uh, maybe. I think it would be so fun sometime to do, you know, I mean, I think a lot of us use multiple narrators and I think it would be really fun to to do a book where, you know, each author writes a different point of view. And there are no um, two people that I'd rather work with than Lisa and Heather. Exactly. I can put that out there, ladies. That's the same. I, that's the same. I think it would be super exciting and cool. And that would be brilliant, too, to have, like, just one story, but, like, three different perspectives. It would be oh, yeah. Really awesome. Yeah. Well, come on, ladies. We've already established the same, the same publisher, the same editor, the same publicist. So it shouldn't be all that hard to put right. it together. You heard it here first. You did. That's right. You got to cut the advance idea. three ways, though. That's not fun. No, it's great. <laughs> well, that's okay. We get to work together. So it's okay. We're right together. We're, yeah, I yeah. think it'd be amazing. It'd be amazing. Well, thank you both, all three of you, for your time, Patrick, for your time, and readers. Thank you very much for joining us. And remember, we do have autographed copies of all three books. And yeah, and if you buy them as a match set, they'll be perfect on your shop. They do look good together, don't they? I love it. So <laughs> great. Thank you, Barbara, thank you. for having such an amazing store. The Poison Pen is like one of my all-time favorite stores. So thank you for being a legend and for having a legendary store that is so supportive of authors. We're so grateful. That's very kind of you. Thank you. It only works because of the support from you authors and actually for all the readers watching this. So, you know, they're the foundation on which the rest of us rest. So anyway, thank you all very much. Good night, everybody. Enjoy the rest of Thanks, your evening. Everybody. And Heather and Mary, enjoy your book tours. Yeah, thank you. Excited. Oh, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.